Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Awesome. So, uh, thanks uh, for coming to this very first um, talk about AI ops. And I think the first thing that I'd like to um, do before diving into the details is to set the stage what AI ops means, because nowadays it's often confused with ML ops. So, where ML ops, which is machine learning operations, uh, focuses on how we operate machine learning workloads with operations and uh, in the cloud native works uh, word, world, AI ops more focuses on how we can use AI to improve and augment operations. So although AI and ML are like similar and synonym in used, um, those two terms uh, should be different, differentiated. So this is how I look like um, on the internet. I'm very close to Denmark, and there's still the old logo, unfortunately. Oh, oops. Um, this big nose avatar, that's me. Um, close to Denmark, close to the Baltic Sea. Usually, we only get like 20 degrees. We only ship passengers, no containers yet, not cloud native unfortunately, but we're working on it. This is uh, the logo, I'm, um, I'm working for Red Hat, it's a stealth startup um, to be uh, to doing its exit soon. Oh no, we already did our exit. And I'm working in the office of the CTO, also known as Octo. And we do a lot of uh, funny things, making sure that things don't implode, play around with uh, new technologies. And uh, it looks dangerous, but actually it's a lot of fun. Also, like to level set how Red Hat sees AI, because um, Red Hat's usually an infrastructure provider. What the heck are we doing with AI? So first um, and foremost, we also want to make sure that AI workloads run really well on top of the infrastructure and the platform that we provide. And um, yeah, so one of the projects here um, is Project Toth um, that a colleague of mine is working on where we look into optimizing AI stacks and uh, one of the cool things that he did is uh, um, that they are doing is recompiling TensorFlow just for your individual machine and by just recompiling it with the correct uh, flags uh, we can squeeze out um, 10 to 15 percent more um, performance just by recompiling TensorFlow. And another side note I love talk, talks where you get some pointers where to um, follow up after the talk, so I put these sticky notes on top of the slides. You can take pictures whenever you see them, or at the end of the presentation, I'm going to show up all those uh, sticky notes. Then, another thing that our team works on is the but where I'm uh, proudly wearing a shirt off. This is uh, a reference architecture of a platform to manage AI and machine learning workloads on top of OpenShift or Kubernetes. So uh, it's not a product per se that you can buy, it's, but it's a community project that you can readily install in your operator and you get a bunch of interesting um, components installed, Spark, Jupyter, etc., uh, which would kickstart your And um, this talk is about intelligent, but also at the same time we are trying to um, make our own products more intelligent and um, augment some AI capabilities in those products. And if we're talking about OpenShift and Kubernetes, most of the time we're dealing with 
time series data, which is metrics. And if you're operating, you consume all these time series metrics um, and you have no clue what to do with them. So we use some AI to make you a bit smarter of this, uh, with this. So I'm going to talk about Prometheus, what it is, then um, how to store it for long term, because as you know, um, without data, nothing. Then we look at the anatomy of an anomaly, and finally, how to integrate all that into your monitoring setup. This talk is not about a shiny product and the holy grail of monitoring, so that's not what I'm going to give you. And I'm not going to show you how we turned our um, messy, messy monitoring solution into this um, old school spider demon. And I'm also not going to show you a success story, how we applied some of these things. It's more like we've investigated how we can use AI and machine learning on top of um, Prometheus data. And we'll, I'll point you to some tools and scripts to get started on that journey. I'll have some questions that you might ask yourself and maybe so also some answers to those questions. And the good thing, it's all open source. So what is Prometheus? Maybe um, some of you folks can raise your hand who know what Prometheus is. It's great. So the, the knowledgeable folks are in the front. And um, to those folks in the background, I have this great Prometheus architecture slide, right? So everybody loves architecture slides. So now you know what Prometheus is, right? And we can go to the bottom of it. No. Let's back up a little bit. So Prometheus, um, in a simplistic worldview, is a Greek guy. And as we're in the Kubernetes world, everything has to be named after Greek people that did some stuff. And Prometheus was, was the guy that um, returned fire back from the gods to the humans and hence the torch. So now you know the story why Prometheus has this torch symbol. And Prometheus... Um, looks at targets. That's how they call them. And as we want to monitor things, Prometheus monitors those targets by pulling data from those targets. And that's really important. So every target, like you have a web application, you have a database service or a pod or anything, exposes its metrics via normal HTTP route slash metrics. And Prometheus is the one that pulls the current state of the target and stores it well, in its database. It's a very optimized time series database written in Go, especially for these kind of operations. And without any alerting, you probably can't do monitoring, so it also has the capability to write some rules, how it, when to trigger an alert, and then it pushes out these alerts to an alert manager to get you notified. So in essence, in its core, Prometheus is made for monitoring and alerting based on a very capable time series DB. So the question, what do we need for machine learning? Any idea? Any from you guys? Just say one word. Data. Exactly. So, what's the data in Prometheus going to look like? Um, but before I go into how the data actually looks like, <laughs> I'm a bit confused of my uh, slides here. So, um, I'm going to talk about how to um, store the data for long term because. Um, if you just have a short time window, you probably can't do any long-term predictions. And as I said earlier, Prometheus is made for monitoring and alerting. It doesn't give you capabilities to store your metrics for a very long time. It usually has a retention of like two days or something like this, but it's not for giving you um, the data back from your last Black Friday sales uh, 
from last year. So we needed to look for some solutions how to store it for long term. At that time when we started this project, like one year ago, um, we looked at a project called Thanos, which uh, I thought was also a Greek god, but apparently it's just some uh, Marvel character. Um, it's uh, based on a large part of the Prometheus code base. What it does is takes uh, the time series blob that we saw earlier that is stored on disk and puts it into some object storage and does some optimization like downscaling and um, pre-processing of the internal queries, internal metrics for some, uh, so that your queries can run faster and then provides a global view on your installed Prometheus instance plus the metrics that you offloaded to your object storage and in essence it gives you unlimited storage for your Prometheus metrics data but at that time we had some problems installing it so we looked at some other um, solutions to that and one thing for a time series that always also pops up um, to your mind is InfluxDB which is also written in Go which is integrates very nice um, to to Prometheus because you can just point your Prometheus instance to write with a remote write API write its time series metrics to another database which happens to be Influx and it integrates very nice with Prometheus. Just, just, just install Influx, do one configuration setting in Prometheus and off you go. But unfortunately um, Influx tries to hold all the information in its memory so if we look at two, um, two months or four months of data the memory spikes really really high and the solution at, um, that Influx gives is you go to a clustered environment you spin up a cluster of Influx um, nodes unfortunately this solution didn't work out for us because it's uh, it's the paid model of Influx so if you're running it in your data center and you already have Influx it's a very good product and you're happy to use it but for for us it just didn't work because uh, yeah RAM so what we did we created a Prometheus scraper pod this um, thing still exists out there we scrape Prometheus the Prometheus API and the returned JSON metrics would we store on our Ceph object storage which is just an S3 compatible object storage so we had these JSON blobs lying there for days or hours worth of data. The good thing about this is you don't need to talk to your ops people. So they don't need to reconfigure their Prometheus instances. I only need access to that uh, instance, which is something that you get easier than a new configuration setting that uh, writes the TSDB blobs somewhere or something else. So it's less intrusive. And the good thing is that it can be queried by Spark SQL. So Spark, as uh, some of you might know, is a um, good for MapReduce kind of workload, batch processing, etc. So if you have large data sets um, that span terabytes of data um, and you want to query them just like a database, um, then Spark, Spark QL is it called Spark SQL? No, Spark QL um, to the rescue. You point it at the S3 backend where your JSON blobs are stored, and they load into memory or into distributed memory, and um, you can do some simple analysis like the median of um, or the variance or whatever um, of these metrics of these of these data sets. And we also have, here we have some notebooks um, that connect to this kind of data. But until then, things have changed. Thanos uh, is 
now a very good integrated um, solution and it's running in production um, in our team and we're collecting from the OpenShift 4 clusters thousands of metrics in production um, to a Thanos cluster running at our um, in, in our servers so nowadays if you want to store data uh, Prometheus data for the long term Thanos is I think the right way to go and the integration is really 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 easy and straightforward because querying Thanos feels exactly like querying Prometheus so what do we really need for machine learning consistent data going back to um, how our data looks like um, Prometheus metrics, metric types can be of four types. First is a gauge, which is basically a time series. Then we have counters, which are special time series. They are um, monotonically increasing, so a gauge can go up and down, and a counter probably, hopefully, just goes up until something is being reset. Then we have histograms which are cumulative histograms of uh, values and summaries, which are snapshot of values in a certain time value. And the, to grasp the difference between a histogram and a summary, you probably need to read the documentation a couple of times. But basically, if you only want to know the distribution of your values in buckets, then use a histogram. But if you want to know some actual values, like a sample, um, how long your longest query took, then you probably want to use a summary. So here in picture again, gauge goes up and down, counter goes up, and a histogram and a summary and a metric. So metrics is easier to say and, okay, I know, um, than to actually understand. So if I'm saying a metric to you, you think of a well, it's a time series, but in, in Prometheus, having a metric called like load one or, um, or some like latency of your, of your web service, that's just the name of the metric. But an actual time series is composed of the metric name and its labels. So every unique combination of the metric name plus its uh, labels and the values for those uh, labels make up a time series. So choose very wisely what you put in those labels because uh, if you have an infinite amount of values for those labels, you probably have an infinite amount of metrics, which is not so good. So Monitoring is hard. If you remember that Prometheus just pulls from those targets, we see that slash metrics, the target, can expose anything to you. Right? So I'm not in control what metrics I'm getting. If I'm installing OpenShift or um, Kubernetes, I get 1,000 metric names, which is not 1,000 metrics, because you have the, this uh, combination with the labels. So have, you have a lot of time series being thrown at you. And with every iteration of that, this web service, the pods that are being installed in your cluster, you can get other metrics. So we don't have a schema that is being enforced, which is uh, hard for a data scientist and as we know, it's 80% of your time is understanding those, uh, um, those uh, names and throwing away the bad stuff where just some developer changed some metric name and you don't understand, you don't know what it means. So I think the first thing that you want to do is some analysis of the metric, um, of the metadata in those metrics. And that's what we did. We came up with some notebooks um, looking at the distribution of 
the labels here we say here we see for I don't know what metric that is but um, basically we're plotting the label values over some time and uh, we see that at one point the amount of values just doubled another analysis that we uh, did is called um, t distributed stochastic neighbor embedding I can barely pronounce that name so we get an abbreviation for it it's called TSNE I have no clue how that works but if I check that notebook and point it at my data even um, me as as, uh, as a simple guy can see that there are some clusters in there and there are some clusters that are smaller than others so maybe we have a problem here and maybe we can identify talk with the monitoring guys why are there some smaller clusters of these labels so using these notebooks to talk with the monitoring world um, or understanding the initial um, nature of the metrics that you're looking at um, can kickstart you in your discovery with Prometheus metrics. Now we're going to anomaly types because in the end we want to detect something anomalous in our system once we understood how uh, what metrics are good and what met metrics we wanted to focus on we want to see if there are some anomalies in my in our metrics. And for understanding what an anomaly is, um, we need to understand the components of a time series. So a time series can have a trend, it can go up or down, and it can have some inner trends, which we would call a seasonality. Like in the morning, you have a lot of people powering up their computers, so you will have a spike there, and then in the evening when everybody leaves the office, it will go down, and this happens every day until we have a weekend and then the seasonality changes right so this is also some um, nature of that time series and if we're looking at anomaly types it's basically something that doesn't happen as expected so if usually the trend is going up and suddenly it goes down I would call it an anomaly if the seasonality always is like really cyclic but then it somehow differs from what I'm expecting, it's an anomaly. If usually I'm at a threshold of 2 and suddenly I'm seeing values at 5, 6, I would call it an anomaly. And to um, specify that anomaly a bit more precise, I would call it a pointwise anomaly, a seasonal anomaly, or maybe a trend anomaly. So plotting these graphs here is very important for you um, to plot them over a long time to get a feeling for it. And then you can use a tool like Profit, which we embedded in our um, systems, uh, in our container. This is a library from Facebook. It's still actively maintained, which and it's pretty cool. You just give it some time series and it spits out an upper window uh, upper 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 why had upper an upper band and a lower band for that for that window and a predict prediction of the time series so the black dots are my observed values and the blue line is what the profit will predict and it also extracts a trend of your data so here we see that it goes a little bit up on the right and it, it, will, it will extract a seasonality of your data. So what you probably just do is, would do is use profit, predict the value that you are observing, that you would observe at time n plus x, compare it with your actually observed value and if it differs, throw an alert call everybody on duty, hey, we have a different uh, monitored value than we were expecting, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> because then, then you would always call your folks because you're j uh, just seeing one anomaly, which is probably okay for a distributed system. So you would also want to find out when you are actually calling something an anomaly and want to call somebody on pager duty. 
And here are also some clever things. Um, this is just one, exam one example how you would define an actual anomaly. In the accumulator example, you would just have a counter when you have a value that is, um, is an anomaly type. You would increase that counter, and if you the next value that you're seeing um, is not an anomaly, you would de decrease that counter, but with a higher number. And then the the only thing that you would set up is at what point of that increased counter you would actually call it an, an anomaly. And you can experiment with different kinds of um, these these uh, filters for anomaly types um, until you're happy and work with your monitoring folks um, to actually bring value to the table. So the architecture so far, architecture setup so far, we have some application running on top of OpenShift, Kubernetes, which is reporting its values, its metrics to Prometheus. We store those values in Ceph or in Thanos then we have some Jupyter notebooks where you do some initial research, some data science exploration part to understand the values and the nature of your metrics. And you're also using Spark um, to process that larger bit of data. Or maybe not if you're using tunnels. Anyway, now you want to get your hands on something and you don't want to... Um, open up those, all those notebooks, know we're living in a container world, and as we saw in the keynotes, it's just a matter of reverse searching in my history and firing off that cube control uh, command, and oh, boom, you have 10,000 containers running. And that's what we created, sort of, for you. So we... Store its forecasted values in its uh, attached storage somehow, and then, and that I think is the nice thing about this um, setup. Expose. My forecaster becomes just another target for Prometheus. So I, the only thing that I need to set up with my monitoring folks is give me access to your Prometheus environment and also scrape myself. And this container is really easy to install in your cluster to experiment with because it's just a container. It's Um, yeah, it has some configuration, and as we always um, configure our stuff with environment variables, the only thing that you would set up is a different name for the It's Kubelet, Docker operations, blah, 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 Y hat, upper nom, uh, um, Y hat, where's the Y hat? Fourier, or oh, profit anomaly. Um, so these metrics are being created out of the configuration that you give it. And you can set up some alerting rules to be alerted if you see an application. And as everybody loves demos, let's move my window over here. So I have prepared something for you. I have on my laptop a mini shift uh, cluster running where I have a Prometheus and where I have this training application. So this guy here is scraping my Prometheus and I've configured it with a metric. And as we see, it's exposing these predicted node load one Fourier Y hat upper. So I'm predicting the metric name node load one, which is uh, just the load of this node, obviously. Um, and I'm not using 
profit for this one, but I'm using Fourier, which is another way to forecast time series. Um, and it's giving me the upper boundary of zero, which is a number. <laughs> okay. So I can also look at this data in Prometheus, which is very nice to start with, to begin with, but everybody loves real dashboards and graphs, so we also have a Grafana graph. And in the upper graph, I'm seeing the actual, for, actual value, like here the red one, versus the... Um, real value versus the Fourier prediction, and as you can see here, the blue line matches And here we see some anomalies being predicted. And unfortunately, profits didn't predict an anomaly here. Why? I don't know. Maybe the accumulator wasn't uh, tuned um, so far. This demo data here is a year old, so I don't remember it um, completely. Um, but Fourier found an anomaly. So, great. So, that's something you would get out of the box by just... Get his hand here with the Prometheus dimension. So, here's the URLs that you might want to take pictures of. Unless you work in my team, then you should probably. Uh, <laughs> and it's open up for questions. Yes, please. Just a second. Thank you. Did you have any issues using uh, FB Profit on second uh, data, or were you using seconds, or did you use a, a larger time uh, series uh, amount? Because I know that it has trouble working on very small increments of time, because it was designed for business data, uh, like sales or something like that, day-to-day um, -day kind of stuff. That's an interesting question. So you mean from the precision of uh, seconds? I think on, on the time precision, or you mean secondary data? Yeah, were your timestamps like seconds, like literal seconds, um, or were they minutes or hours? Yeah. I think we are using um, a, se a, se a second sample data there. So okay. I'm, I'm not sure if did we have any problems with the with the granular granularity of the data. I'm seeing no's. Apparently not. Minutely data. Yeah. Okay. And okay, profit is much better at doing daily and weekly seasonality. Exactly. 
But it's an interesting um, thought. So you maybe made, might connect with Hima um, and Anand, who did the actual work of that. So I'm just showcasing stuff that's. Uh, Yes. No, Grafana is a separate tool, um, different from Prometheus, but it's sort of the most used graphing tool in the um, cloud native world because it is really easy to build your custom dashboards and graphs and it's really well suited for time series data and it's now also dipping into the space of log data. Yeah, no? Then thank you for your valuable time and listening to me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>